An hour north of New York City, a band of deadly gunmen descended on a peaceful suburban community. They struck quickly and savagely. Agents learned that the gang's leader had been living underground for more than two decades. The FBI's New York Anti-Terrorist Task Force hoped they could find this most wanted fugitive before he killed again. series of armored car heists and bloody shootouts shock law enforcement. The brutal violence of the crimes suggested a motive more complex than greed. When the robbers started targeting police, the FBI took charge. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents would expend thousands of man hours to stop an armed gang that terrorized New York. Rockland County, New York, 1981. The burgeoning suburb just 20 miles north of New York City had become a refuge of former city dwellers. Most left their urban homes in pursuit of safer, more affordable neighborhoods for their families. They enjoyed more open space and lower crime rates. The town of Nanuet was typical and drew many people to its new mall. At 3.40, October 20th, 1981, a Brinks armored truck made its regularly scheduled pickup from a retailer. One guard remained in the truck while another watched the doors. The third returned with cash and receipts. With no warning, a gang of masked men burst out of a red van. One guard was hit in the throat, another was hit in the arm. The gunmen then trained their weapons on the driver. He shot back, but the assailant's gunfire was overwhelming. One guard managed to climb into the back of the truck for protection. Police Chief Alan Colsey of the South Nyack Grandview Police Department was five miles away when he received the call. Officers from other nearby towns were also called since Nanuet was too small to support its own police force. In October of 1981, when the Brinks case occurred, it was an extremely shocking event for the entire area of Rockland County, for the Nyack community, for the Clarkstown community. This was something that they had never expected to ever see. Clarkstown police and paramedics arrived first. They placed one guard on life support, hoping he would survive the ride to the hospital. Brinks guard Peter Page would never get that chance. A gunshot had severed major arteries in his right shoulder and neck. He died before help arrived. The uninjured driver said though the gunman had worn masks, he believed they were black males. They sped off in a red van. From a deposit law, police learned that $1.6 million was missing. 1.3 million remained in the truck. Chief Colsey received updates as he raced to the crime scene. The first information coming in from the Nanuet scene was that the suspects had been seen escaping in a red van. They were eastbound on Route 59. 
This would take them along a route adjacent to the New York State Thruway, which leads directly into New York City over the Tappan Zee Bridge. Moments later, a local resident close to the mall reported seeing masked gunmen in a parking lot, transferring sacks and weapons into a small moving truck. The witness told Clarkstown police that the vehicles exited eastbound. Detective Arthur Keenan and two other police cruisers were on Route 59, close to the throughway entrance when they received the update. We proceeded on to Route 59 near the New York State Thruway to see if we would see uh, the getaway vehicle. We went to that area figuring that would be a uh, getaway route. When the officers arrived at the intersection of Mountain View Road and Interstate 87, they noticed a moving truck waiting to turn left onto the throughway. Keenan ordered one patrol unit to block the on-ramp. Then, Detective Keenan received a call about a second moving truck. At that time, there was a radio transmission from the Orangetown police that they had a U-Haul truck um, heading southbound on Route 304 near the New Jersey line, which was approximately the same distance from the Nanuet Mall as we were. Unsure if the truck on Route 59 was the suspects, Sergeant Edward O'Grady and Detective Keenan blocked the truck. Officers Brian Lennon and Waverly Chip Brown approached the drivers. The suspects were described as being uh, black males. At the intersection, we observed the driver and passenger as being white individuals. The woman objected to the shotgun. Sergeant O'Grady directed Lennon to return the gun to the patrol car. They believed they had stopped the wrong truck. As Lennon secured the gun, the detective inspected the back of the moving truck. Though it didn't appear locked, the back door wouldn't open. He told the couple that he wanted to see what was inside. I couldn't understand why it wouldn't open. I wanted to know what was in the back of the truck. And then instantly, as, as I was said that a noise came from the truck, I turned and all the suspects were coming out of the back uh, shooting. The rounds from the officer's six-shot revolvers bounced off the bulletproof vests worn by the armed gang. Officer Lennon rushed back to his patrol car for his shotgun. Officer Brown was shot in the neck and shoulder and fell to the ground. Even if the officers were wearing their vests, it wouldn't have helped. We were at a disadvantage. In addition to which the ammunition that was being used in the M16 uh, was capable of uh, going through uh, vests. As the masked gunman approached, one executed Officer Brown at point-blank range. Detective Keenan was hit in the leg and ran for cover. I was still being fired at, uh, even after I took cover. I had shots go between my legs. The tree that I was behind took a shot chest high. Officer Lennon had unlocked his shotgun, but was taking heavy fire. The gunman rammed the police car, trying to clear it for their escape. It didn't work. Then, two cars arrived at the scene. The suspects gathered the money bags and piled into the cars. One suspect never made it to a getaway car. A passing motorist grabbed the woman who had been a passenger in the truck and prevented her escape. watched the white Oldsmobile and tan Honda speed away. Officers Keenan and Lennon rushed to help their injured colleagues. As the suspects made their getaway, I went to both uh, Waverly Brown and uh, Eddie O'Grady to see if there was anything I could do for them. 
Waverly Brown and Eddie were both beyond any medical attention that I could uh, administer. Still en route, Chief Alan Colson's main focus now was to find the fleeing vehicles, but reports were scattered and hard to decipher. It was very, very difficult at this particular time to get a, a clear, open communication uh, from anyone out in the field back to a desk area because of the number of communications that were literally stepping on one another. As the chief approached the area, he determined that the crime scene didn't need any more personnel or vehicles. He set out to find those responsible. I didn't want to interfere with the emergency response in that area. The road was completely blocked. So knowing that this particular escape route would lead them in a particular direction, I made a U-turn at Mountain View in 59 and traced my steps back. He figured the suspects would travel towards New York City, where there was potential for a greater loss of life. He believed their route would take them along Mountain View Avenue to a T intersection. I figured there was a 50-50 shot that they were either going to go east or west and that I could cover at least one of those avenues of, of escape and, uh, and went immediately to that area as quickly as I could. In fact, en route to that particular intersection, um, I observed the suspect vehicles, two of them, at a high rate of speed heading east on Christian Harold Road. The chief followed the cars. He radioed in his position and asked for backup. It was clear to me, based upon the events that had transpired up until that point, that these were extremely dangerous individuals who had no compulsion or no regard for human life and no hesitancy to take the utmost of violent actions against anybody who would st stand in their way. Until units arrived, it would be up to him to stop two vehicles that held six heavily armed cop killers. After following for a few minutes, the chief noticed that two passengers in the Honda had ducked out of sight, perhaps to load guns. As we get to the corner of 6th and Broadway, the Oldsmobile makes a right-hand turn onto Broadway going south into the middle of town, and the tan Honda attempts to do the same, but slides, skids across the road. The chief positioned his car between himself and the fugitives. He drew his gun and continued to call for backup, hoping his voice could be heard over the clamor of simultaneous calls. I continually order the suspects out of the vehicle. There's a period of, 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 of a few seconds where nothing in fact happens. And then the door opens up and I see a female put her feet out onto the roadway and remain seated in the front seat of the car. The chief repeated his commands to exit the vehicle with their hands in the air. The woman then began to reach behind the seat, perhaps for a gun. Then a second occupant walked towards the officer wearing a bulletproof vest. Despite my repeated orders to the contrary, one of the suspects came walking up towards me. The female was attempting to reach around and get something which I immediately assumed to be a weapon. The chief was outnumbered, and neither of the suspects obeyed his orders. He made one more desperate call for backup. Robert, Robert. On October 20th, 1981, the Nyack New York police chief had stopped one of two getaway cars filled with suspects from an armored car robbery that had left three dead and two wounded. As he continued to call for backup, one suspect reached behind her seat, another approached the chief wearing a bulletproof vest. He was outnumbered, and neither of the suspects obeyed his orders. As the chief made one last desperate radio call, backup arrived. Get on the ground, face down. Get on the ground, get on the ground, face down. They secured the scene and pulled a third suspect from the back seat. Police believed that he had been an armed lookout for the other two, but was injured and dropped his weapon when their getaway car careened out of control. Police searched the car. 
In the trunk, they recovered sacks that held in excess of $1 million. Under the front seat, they found a loaded 9mm pistol, the weapon the woman had likely been reaching for. Thousands attended the funeral for the officers slain at the October 20th shootout. The entire community shared the grief felt by Detective Arthur Keenan at the loss of his colleagues. The death of my two friends, Chipper Brown and Eddie O'Grady, definitely affected my life from that point forward. When you're in a small community like that, in a small police department like that, you, uh, you go to each other's weddings and christenings and barbecues and things of that nature, and it, it becomes a, like a secondary th family of sorts. And uh, so it was very devastating to uh, lose two of, two of your good friends. The four murder suspects, including the woman captured at the roadblock, maintained their silence while arraigned at Nyack Village Hall. Police had no way to know how many more were still at large. The law enforcement community in Rockland County was taken greatly by surprise by the sequence and magnitude of the events. This was really a small assault team that, that came to Rockland County to, to rob this, this Brinks truck, and it was, it was a, uh, a magnitude and a seriousness and a, a firepower that had never been seen anywhere in the law enforcement community here. If Nyack police were not used to such violence, 30 miles south in New York City, the FBI and New York City police certainly were. The New York Joint Terrorism Task Force had already been investigating a series of armored car heists throughout the region that had been executed in a similar fashion. Now retired Special Agent Lou Vesey was a member of that team. He believed the Nyack robbery was connected to the others. The people who had done Nyack had to have some involvement with all these other crimes. I mean, because the MO was absolutely identical. Uh, the whites were driving the vehicles, the blacks had done the robberies, the, uh, the weapons that were used were identical to the weapons that had been used in the, other, in the other robberies we were looking at. So there was no doubt in anybody's mind that this was the, at least some of the same group. The suspects were processed at the Rockland County Jail. When asked for their names, all gave aliases, except one. Judy Clark, arrested in the getaway car, was no stranger to the FBI. To agents, she was known as a member of the Weather Underground, a radical group involved in many violent robberies and bombings in the 1960s and 70s. For the Brinks robbery, she would be sentenced to 75 years in prison. Special Agent Lou Vesey was an expert on the weather underground. One female I recognized immediately as Judy Clark, who had been someone who had been under investigation previously by us as a possible terrorist. There was another female there who I, who I thought looked very familiar. Agent Vesey suspected the woman arrested at the roadblock was Kathy Boudin, another member of the Weather Underground. A fingerprint check confirmed it. Boudin pled guilty and was sentenced to 20 years in prison for acting as a decoy passenger in the moving truck. They discovered one of the men to be David Gilbert, Boudin's common-law husband, who was also a member of the Weather Underground. He received 75 years for his role. Sam Brown, who had been injured in the getaway car, was an associate of the Black Liberation Army, another militant group. Like Gilbert and Clark, Brown was sentenced to 75 years in prison. Four members of the gang were behind bars. From survivors' statements, agents estimated at least seven more were out on the streets. Special Agent Ken Maxwell joined the investigation to help determine who and where the remaining fugitives might be. One new lead held promise. The second getaway car had been found a few miles away. 
the Oldsmobile, was found in Westchester County, dumped or abandoned. Inside, there was a great deal of blood indicating that whoever had uh, abandoned the vehicle had been wounded during the shootout. Agents checked local hospitals for gunshot victims. They found no patients whose whereabouts were unaccounted for on the day of the shootout. The Oldsmobile was registered to a woman at an apartment on Prospect Street in East Orange, New Jersey. They suspected that the armed fugitives had taken refuge there. Agents obtained a search warrant. They found no one inside and began to process the apartment. The location in East Orange, New Jersey was a treasure trove of evidence. It's what we commonly refer to as a safe house. Inside that safe house, the New Jersey State Police and the FBI located a tremendous amount of documentary evidence indicating other safe houses, uh, other vehicles used by these subjects, and also uh, photographs and other forms of identification that began to unravel the mystery as to who was involved. One key name investigators discovered on rent receipts was the legal name of the tenant, Marilyn Jean Buck. The FBI knew her name and history. She was a known operative of the Black Liberation Army and its only white member. Well, Marilyn Buck had a long history of her involvement with uh, radical politics, if you will. Uh, at the time of the robbery, she was a fugitive who had gone underground and was wanted on weapons charges. What is that? Agents also found a bomb-making manual, right diagrams of six police precincts, and a hit list naming civic and business leaders. They turned up more false IDs, disguises, a shotgun, two 9mm pistols, and ammunition. A ledger with detailed notes made in Marilyn Buck's handwriting revealed the group's illicit activities. It listed dates and expenditures for rental cars, guns, ammunition, and illegal drugs. As investigators sifted through the evidence, they began to encounter a problem that would plague them throughout this complex case, according to Agent Lou Vesey. I think the real difficulty is just the sheer bulk of information and evidence. Numerous pieces of evidence from numerous crime scenes, uh, individuals who constantly used aliases, false identification, had safe houses. You had to figure out who was who. Was that person identical to a person with a different name, but a same physical description in another safe house? It was a gigantic jigsaw puzzle, and sometimes you didn't think you had all the pieces. Agents still didn't know who was involved, where they were, and why they did it. So Mr. Brown, how to get answers, to the FBI needed to develop a cooperating witness. They turned to Sam Brown in Otisville Prison, the gunman arrested after the car chase. He was a low-level associate of the Black Liberation Army. Brown cooperated in the hopes that his sentence would be lightened. Sam Brown was the only one who decided to talk to the investigators. He really got us started. He's the one that named a few names, and with those few names, that's where the investigation began widening out to the rest of them. So he was very important. The most valuable name Brown provided was that of the mastermind behind the armed robbery, Matulu Shakur. Shakur was a known militant, the leader of the Black Liberation Army, and one of the highest ranking members of the gang who called themselves The Family. The Family was a group of about a dozen terrorists, comprised primarily of members of the Weather Underground and Black Liberation Army. Their formal association was news to Agent Maxwell. We had known from prior investigations in the past that these groups had communicated, that they had some common uh, 
goals and objectives. But never before had that communication or association evolved into this type of criminal activity. Brown told agents that the family met on many occasions to plan the Nyack robbery. Matulu Shakur assigned jobs to each member of the group. You know what to do with that. Yes, sir. Edward Joseph and Donald Weems were assigned as gunmen in the armored car assault. The FBI knew Weems was a member of the Black Panthers and the Black Liberation Army. He had escaped from prison in 1978. Investigators knew little about Joseph. Another man named Chewy Ferguson would handle the M16 assault rifle. Samuel Lee Smith would be armed with a shotgun. I don't want anybody to fire these weapons. So Chewy says, Chewy's a weapon man, all right? Brown didn't know the names of the others, but provided agents with physical descriptions. Agents put out APBs for the five names given, which included Samuel Lee Smith. In Queens, homicide detectives were on their way to Smith's last known address. A license plate registered to him had been found in a safe house. As one detective drove down Smith Street, he passed a driver who fit the suspect's description. The detective called for a marked unit to stop him. When the man saw the lights, he took off. Police followed him into an alley. Get out of the Put your hands out the window. Use your left hand and open the door. Step out of the vehicle. Step out of the car. You step out of the car. Get out of the car. Step out of the car. Step out of the car. Keep your hands back. For the third time in as many days, an armed member of the family had opened fire on uniformed officers. Samuel Lee Smith, the fugitive wanted for his role in the shooting deaths of two police officers and an armored car guard, had opened fire on New York City police. His attack did not last long. He was killed by the officers returning fire. Smith was the fifth member of a terrorist group called The Family to have been taken off the streets. Seven others remained at large, with almost a million dollars in stolen cash still missing. On a tip from Sam Brown, a gang member already in custody, police canvassed a Bronx neighborhood for another suspect named Donald Weems. Special Agent Ken Maxwell recalls that Brown knew very little about Weems. Brown had given us a general description of a neighborhood in the Bronx where he had met this individual who fit the description of Weems. My partner and I, after a process of elimination and a lot of legwork, pinpointed a building that possibly could be the place Brown was talking about. Detectives canvassed the neighborhood, hoping someone would know Weems and reveal his address. They got lucky. A neighbor directed police to his apartment. He told them Weems was upstairs right now. Detectives called for backup. Since every other encounter with these terrorists had resulted in gunfire, they prepared for the worst. In a short time, they entered the building with a warrant and a SWAT team. They had no idea if Weems was alone or if he was armed. There were some anxious moments in terms of waiting, but then he ultimately came out and surrendered in the hallway. In his apartment, however, we found uh, several firearms, a gas mask, a bulletproof vest, and enough ammunition to do battle with a small army. Weems was the only member of the family inside. 
He was tried on federal charges and found guilty of robbery and second degree murder. He was sentenced to 75 years in prison. Though six members of the family were now in custody, group leader Matulu Shakur remained on the streets. Once again, cooperating informant Sam Brown provided agents with a lead. He believed Matulu Shakur could most likely be found in Harlem at the acupuncture clinic Shakur had founded. The FBI and NYPD set up 24-hour surveillance on the clinic. We utilized um, agents and detectives of uh, diverse ethnic backgrounds to do our best to blend into certain neighborhoods. We knew from both experience and also recognizing the um, intelligence and versatility of this group that we had to be particularly discreet in uh, surveilling these individuals. Agents watched and listened for months. Though Shakur never showed, they noted several others who came and went quite often. Agents hoped they would eventually lead them to Shakur. One night, agents followed a man from the clinic to a house at 85 Barrow Street in Greenwich Village. They learned the house was rented to Edward Joseph, one of the suspects named by informant Sam Brown in the Nyack robbery and shootout. They suspected Shakur was hiding there. They were right. Their months of perseverance had paid off. A federal judge authorized a Title III. This permitted agents to set up wiretaps and bugs. Shakur and Joseph must have suspected the FBI's presence, since they often turned up the TV when they talked. Despite this, agents were able to pick up snippets of incriminating conversations, including a discussion of killing informant Sam Brown. After several weeks, agents had enough evidence for a warrant to raid the Greenwich Village hideout. On the night of March 25th, 1982, six months since the murders and robbery in Nyack, agents prepared for the assault. They'd strike early the next morning, hoping to catch the fugitives asleep and unaware. As the agents watched and waited, they saw Shakur enter the house. Dawn, two SWAT teams arrived. One team entered through the front door. The other covered the fire escape and back. They arrested two men, Chewy Ferguson and Edward Joseph, both named as participants in the Nyack. Their leader, Matulu Shakur, was nowhere to be found. Somehow, he'd escaped during the night, slipping past the surveillance. Ferguson and Joseph were convicted on federal charges as accessories for harboring a fugitive, though they were acquitted of murder charges stemming from the Nyack shootings. Both were sentenced to 12 years in prison. On July 23, 1982, almost a year after two officers and a guard had been killed in the Brinks robbery, Matulu Shakur was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Finding the leader of the gang responsible for three cold-blooded murders would now become a priority for every FBI office across the country. Almost a year after a Brinks robbery and shootout with police, FBI agents around the country continued to pursue the mastermind behind the million-dollar heist. Matulu Shakur, 
a leader of the terrorist group called The Family, had been placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Shakur and at least three others remained at large. In the summer of 1982, an agent from New York City traveled to Georgia to interview a member of the family who had been arrested for a separate bank robbery. Tyrone Risen offered his cooperation in the hopes of a lighter sentence by the state of Georgia. Though he claimed that he was not present when the armored car was robbed in Nyack, New York, he confessed to having helped plan the job that left a Brinks guard and two police officers dead. Risen provided crucial information about other members of the family. Risen was not only a member of the family, he was a very important member of the family and had been involved in all the robberies. He knew who was in the family, he knew the names, and he knew how the family operated. So he was able to describe the MO, the robberies they did, the weapons they used, who did what. Our lookouts, more or less. Risen told the agent how members of the group were able to secure so many aliases. The prisoner explained that a manager of a children's clothing store in Manhattan was key to obtaining false IDs. The manager gathered license information each time a customer paid by check. Since New York State did not require a photo license in the early 80s, an imposter would take the information to the motor vehicles department, claiming she'd lost her license. Then, the DMV would issue a duplicate immediately. Risen also described to Special Agent Maxwell the group's motives. They term these robberies expropriations, almost acts of war. And as one of their members eloquently, or not so elo eloquently, commented one time, in war people get hurt. So when, if you can understand that philosophy, you can understand the, the mindset or the motivation behind the gang. Risen's information helped agents understand more about the inner workings of the group. But by the fall of 1984, three years after the Brinks heist and triple murder, three fugitives still eluded the FBI, including gang leader Matulu Shakur, Marilyn Buck, and Susan Rosenberg. Despite this, time was on the side of the FBI. The longer the fugitives ran, the more likely it was they'd make a mistake. On November 29, 1984, local police received a call from a manager at a storage facility in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. He reported a customer on the premises who had been paying her bill with a credit card that was determined to be stolen. Officers arrived to find the woman about to leave. Inside the back of the van, they noticed containers that appeared to hold explosives. Police asked her for ID. When she reached for her purse under the driver's seat, the cautious officers stopped her. They wanted her hands to stay in plain sight. Inside her purse, they found a weapon. They placed her under arrest. When she was processed, police learned that she was Susan Rosenberg, a member of the family, wanted in connection with the Brinks robbery and shootout. Investigators secured a search warrant for the van. Inside the crates, they found 640 pounds of explosives and 14 weapons. The van was registered in New York State to a woman named Louise Harmon. Agents discovered the name and her address had been falsified. As forensic technicians processed Rosenberg's vehicle, they noticed a sticker on the door from a repair shop in Connecticut. Agents located the New Haven repair shop where the vehicle had been serviced. They hoped the owner would remember the persons who had brought the van in. 
they showed the owner several photographs of women who were known associates of the family. The woman he identified was Marilyn Jean Buck, one of two remaining fugitives in the Brinks robbery and shootout. While Buck had not used her real name on the vehicle's paperwork, she listed an address in Dobbs Ferry, New York on the repair bill. Agents followed up on the lead. They determined that Buck was in Dobbs Ferry and set up surveillance, but she eluded them for months. Then on May 11, 1985, they finally cornered her outside a diner and arrested her. Buck denied knowing Matulu Shakur or having any connection to the Brinks robbery and shootout four years before. But a federal trial would prove differently. Buck was sentenced to 50 years in prison without the possibility of parole. She was extremely important in the planning of the robberies um, and in the procurement of the weapons, as it turns out. A lot of the weapons that the family had, she obtained in gun shows in Texas, buying them under phony names. Now, only one known suspect in the Nyack robbery and shootout remained. Terrorist leader Matulu Shakur. Agents searched a Baltimore apartment rented by Buck, hoping for a lead to Shakur's whereabouts. They discovered paraphernalia for making false identity papers. Wigs likely used in disguises. Plans to bomb federal offices and $10,000 in cash. Searchers also found guns and ammunition stashed in various locations throughout the apartment. And looks like another handgun. Then, scrawled on a piece of paper, agents came across what they'd been hoping for evidence of Matulu Shakur's whereabouts. It listed a phone number in Los Angeles. Special Agent David Mitchell spearheaded the search for Shakur. He contacted the FBI Los Angeles field office to have agents follow up the lead. Special Agent Dana Ingalls in the Los Angeles office advised me that he had interviewed an individual that had established that Shakur had in fact been residing in Los Angeles. Shakur had eluded authorities in a nationwide manhunt for over five years. Agents hoped that this time they could corner him and bring down the leader of the terrorist gang responsible for killing one armored car guard and two police officers. The FBI and NYPD were closing in on Matulu Shakur, the elusive criminal believed to have masterminded a deadly Brinks robbery and shootout. Special Agent David Mitchell had tracked Shakur to L.A., where the terrorist leader remained one step ahead. There were a number of challenges. Shakur was working with a group of individuals that were closely aligned to each other, they had a support network. The um, investigators all assigned to this investigation were having a difficult time getting individuals to cooperate. After many weeks, investigators were finally able to convince an informant to tell what he knew about the fugitive's whereabouts. He said he didn't know where Shakur was hiding, but he identified a man by the name of Chapman, known to be close to Shakur. For about six weeks, agents conducted ground and air surveillance on Chapman and other Shakur associates, but Shakur continued to elude authorities. Shakur was leading a very low profile life in Los Angeles, at least as far as our investigation could determine. Uh, he did not uh, frequent any uh, locations or areas where he could be identified and we virtually knew very little about his activity at that time. As the surveillance continued, 
Mitchell and the other investigators tried to find a pattern to the moves Shakur's associates made to hide him around the city. They pored over apartment rental records and other documents, but learned little. Then on February 11, 1986, their confidential informant called. Hey, thanks. He told them that Chapman would meet with Shakur that night after Chapman left a Lakers basketball game. Investigators located his car and waited for him to leave the forum. Chapman attempted what agents call dry cleaning, counter surveillance tactics designed to lose a tail. He wove through the streets, turning and changing direction. Police stayed with him, not knowing if Chapman had seen them. When Chapman reached his destination, Mitchell's team pulled in nearby. Chapman approached a man they believed was Shakur. Two officers headed to where the men were talking, careful not to attract attention. When Shakur saw them, he took off on foot. They caught up with him in an alley. The arrest of this violent revolutionary closed a five-year nationwide manhunt. When Shakur was arrested, it was apparent to those officers and agents involved in the arrest that he was tired and it was late in the evening. He was transported to the Los Angeles FBI office where Agent Ingalls and I attempted to interview him. Shakur declined to furnish any statement to us during this interview and uh, was subsequently removed back to New York City to face the charges. In the spring of 1986, Shakur was tried on federal charges related to the Brinks robbery and shootout. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison without the possibility of parole. The police officers who survived that terrifying day in Nyack, New York, were relieved that Shakur had been brought to justice. But for South Nyack Police Chief Alan Colsey, the memory of their loss would always be with them. Eddie O'Grady and, and Officer Brown, Chip Brown as we call them, were, were local Nyack community uh, members. They'd gone through the Nyack uh, school district. Um, they had been on the job before I was, and in fact, uh, more or less had sort of brought me uh, and broken me into, uh, into the community. They were very, very close. Uh, to the community and to a lot of us that were were police officers here. They were they were excellent people They were excellent cops and we miss them dearly to this day To commemorate the slain officers a monument was erected in Nyack, New York The surviving colleagues have found some comfort in knowing that the lessons learned from the Nyack shootout have made life safer for citizens as well as for the officers on the street today. Let it not be said that they died in vain, but rather that their ultimate sacrifice led to the identification of a national problem. Uh, I think their ultimate sacrifice and, and their the tragic deaths of everyone involved uh, certainly uh, uncovered a nationwide network of domestic terrorists heretofore unknown and in essence prevented the loss of life to others. <laughs>